Hi, this is Dr. Richard Herbold. Uh, once again, coming to you today, and as the second part of our initial explanation of what a quantitative EEG or neurofeedback as a tool could be, we're going to talk a little bit about and expand a little bit about some of the applications and some of the therapies. So initially, I explained a little bit about quantifying. This is a quantitative EEG. Little file cabinets or measurements of information through delta, theta, alpha, and beta in the brain. That's the actual assessment process. Now, the therapy, to expand that a little bit further, is intriguing depending on what we find. So let's say we're dealing with somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. PTSD responds really well to talk therapy and neurofeedback combined together along with nutritional interventions. So the nutrition is really critical for any brain type of a condition because your brain runs on sugar and oxygen. So if our sugar and our oxygen supply is aberrant, let's say somebody has diabetes as an example. They could have diabetes as a pathology or they could have a functional problem called insulin resistance and reactive hypoglycemia. So those nutritional problems preceding other types of pathologies, potentially diabetes or hyperlipidemia and cholesterol problems, in fact, could be one of the deciding components in somebody getting better. So let's get back to the PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is some sort of an emotional injury that's imprinted on the brain and buried. So what neurofeedback does is it allows that imprint to come to the surface and retraining the areas affected by that. And then it's critical to teach that person through dialogue and talk therapy tools to be able to requalify their experience with that emotion. So that would be an example of neurofeedback. So with neurofeedback and PTSD, we would train the brain, either with electrodes or caps uh, on, the, on the head itself, taking either multiple or even up to 19 different sites on the, on the skull itself to retrain how the delta, theta, alpha, and beta, wherever the discrepancy is, to have normal rhythm. So PTSD would be an example, and another example would be ADHD, or hyperactivity. This is a very prevalent condition in our culture and society. So in our brain, we have different lobes of the brain. We have the frontal lobe, which basically is about the half, front half of the brain itself, and the frontal lobe is what distinguishes us differently from lower forms of life. We have this reptilian brain of days gone by that just like clay and claymation just kind of sticking big chunks of clay on, we've developed this frontal cortex which is unique to us as certain types of mammals. <clears throat> and this frontal cortex has different regions to it. The last region in the frontal cortex typically to myelinate or connect from different areas is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex kind of off to the sides of the front of the brain itself is involved with attentiveness. So if myelination or connections, myelination is basically the connection through something called myelin, which is a coating of a nerve, if those pathways don't myelinate and connect, we don't have the ability to attend or self-attend to um, any kind of a disruption or stimulation. And we become kind of a crow with a shiny coin. Every time something happens or a noise occurs, somebody's off and running and looking in different directions. And you know people like this, they're kind of like talking to a submarine with a periscope, right? They're all over the place. So this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is part of attention deficit disorder that we can actually, depending on what the expression of the ADHD is in the brain map itself, we can actually retrain. So oftentimes theta waves are too high in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This theta, which I mentioned on our first video, I believe, or maybe even in this video, Theta is the brain wave that just after sleep, you have that kind of fuzzy head, but you're just awakening. Oftentimes, that's when the best ideas pop into our head. Now, that's wonderful from that perspective, but if you're trying to concentrate and stay alert and stay attentive, theta at high levels in the dorsal outer prefrontal cortex is not very serving. We can actually sit somebody down, either with uh, connections, and when I mention electrodes, these are not things that are stimulating our brain. What they're doing, they're little sensors that are picking up brain waves. So we never shock the brain when we do neurofeedback. We simply take the actual brain wave itself and through a reward or an inhibit perspective, 
Either we find something that's aberrant and we reward it when it's normal, or we find something that needs to be taken from a higher reactive state and attenuate that or reduce it. So neurofeedback is a process of taking aberrant brain waves, if they're too low or they're too high, and normalizing those. So oftentimes we'll use neurofeedback with uh, watching videos or watching different uh, uh, sequence of events on a, uh, um, on a TV screen or just through sound or through vision, depending on the circumstances. So it might sound a little complicated, and it actually is, but the practical application is always comfortable, is always pleasant, is never uh, irritating, and is always very beneficial to normalizing brain waves. So I hope this was instructional, and neurofeedback is such a wonderful tool. I look forward to, uh, to sharing other pieces of information, and this is Dr. Richard Herbold at Capital District Vitality Center, and thanks so much for your time as always.